In this video, I'm going to write the electric and magnetic fields in terms of the scalar and vector potentials. I'm going to start off with two of Maxwell's equations. These equations are homogeneous equations. So when we say homogeneous, we mean that there are no source terms. We would consider a source term uh, a term including the charge density or the, the current density. So if you have rho or j, the vector quantity j, then you would have a source term. But these two of Maxwell's equations do not have source terms. There is only electric and magnetic fields. The other two of Maxwell's equations do have source terms. So we would consider them inhomogeneous differential equations because they have a combination of electric and magnetic fields on one side, and we can set that equal to a source term. And we will be uh, using those inhomogeneous equations in the next few videos in the electromagnetism playlist. But in this video, all we need to do is we need to take the electric and magnetic fields and write them in terms of the scalar and vector potentials. We're going to need some very useful uh, vector identities for that. So I've written uh, the vector identities which we'll be using over here. In the previous video in the electromagnetism playlist, I derived these two vector identities. And both of these vector identities rely upon the fact that you can swap the order of partial derivatives. So the order of these partial derivatives does not matter. They are commutative. That is because the functions that we're dealing with are continuous. And there is no uh, discontinuities or strange behavior that would prohibit the swapping of those derivatives. So mathematicians can always find functions that do not satisfy these guys. But we're focusing on functions that are well behaved and allow for this order of differentiation uh, to be swapped. So that actually allows us to uh, state these two vector identities. So this first one says that the curl of the gradient of some scalar potential phi is equal to zero. And this one over here says that the divergence of the curl of a vector potential is equal to zero. So this phi over here is a scalar field. And this A over here is a vector field. That's why it has an arrow on the top. Make sure you watch the previous video in the electromagnetism playlist where you can find the full derivation for these two vector identities. Now let's use these guys and the homogeneous pair of Maxwell's equations to derive the desired relationships. First of all, let's take this guy over here. This is Gauss's law for magnetism or Gauss's law for magnetic fields. This tells us that there are no magnetic monopoles. So any time you see a little bit of magnetic field coming out of a region, there has to be a little bit of magnetic field going into a region. So that's why there are no magnetic monopoles. And we discussed this in some of the previous videos. So the divergence of the magnetic field is equal to zero. Now we can actually use this guy in combination with this vector identity, and we can write the magnetic field in terms of the curl of another vector potential. So A is going to be our vector potential, and B is the magnetic field. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set B equal to the curl of A. So I can do this because the divergence is equal to 0. So what I can do now is I can take the divergence of both sides. So I'll take the divergence of both sides, and I'll show you that this actually works it satisfies this equation over here. So if I take the divergence of B, that is going to be equal to the divergence of our new definition of B, which is the curl of A. And have a look in the top right corner in green over here. We have that the divergence of the curl of some vector field is always going to be equal to 0. So this is equal to 0. So Gauss's law for magnetism is satisfied. This is one of the homogeneous Maxwell's equations. So we have satisfied this first equation over here. Now what we have to do is we have to work out what's going to happen with this equation. This is known as Faraday's law of induction. Usually, we have this term written on the right-hand side with a minus sign. And you can actually think of it as Lenz's law as well, because that minus sign tells you the direction. So this guy over here, Faraday's law, is one of Maxwell's equations and it does not have a source term. Now that's good for us because we just want to deal with the electric and magnetic fields. 
So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this new definition for the magnetic field. I'm going to substitute it into here. And then I'm going to do some manipulations, and we're going to isolate this electric field, and that's going to give us an expression for the electric field in terms of the scalar and vector potential. We already have the magnetic field sorted out. So the magnetic field is just the curl of A. It's the curl of the vector potential. But now we need to sort out the electric field. And the electric field is a little more complicated. It's not just the curl. It has a few more operations. So let's substitute this definition into Faraday's law. So what we're going to get is the electric field, or the curl of the electric field, plus the time derivative of B, which is the curl of A, the curl of A is equal to zero. So we know that this is equal to zero. But this is also equal to, I'm going to write this over here, we can swap the order of this curl and this partial time derivative. It's for the same reason that we could swap the order of the partial derivatives in the derivation of these vector identities. We're allowed to swap these derivatives. Over here, we were just swapping spatial derivatives. We were swapping x's and y's and z's. So over here, we're going to be swapping a time derivative with spatial derivatives, because the curl has a bunch of spatial derivatives over here. So here, we just have spatial derivatives. And over here, we just have a time derivative. One important thing that I want to stress on is the fact that we're adding vectors to vectors. So over here, the curl of a vector is going to give us a vector. And over here, we have a vector, and it's getting differentiated with respect to time. And that's going to give us another vector. So we're adding vectors to vectors. We're still adding vectors to vectors over here because the curl of a vector is giving us another vector. So we have a vector and a vector being added together. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap the order of this curl and this partial time derivative. And that's going to give me the curl of the electric field plus the curl of the time derivative of A. And A is our vector potential. So this is what I've done. I've just swapped the order of the curl and the partial time derivative. And now you can see that this curl is acting on the electric field, and we have a curl acting on this derivative. So we can use distributivity, and we can move that curl out, and we can group these terms together. So I'll write that underneath. That's going to give us the curl of this entire thing. We're going to have the electric field plus this time derivative. So we're going to have the electric field plus the partial time derivative of A. And we know that this has to be equal to 0, right? because we, we started off with Faraday's law. This is one of Maxwell's equations. So we know this has to hold. So this has to be equal to 0. All of these guys have to be equal to 0. So I'm just going to set that equal to 0. Now, what does that mean? We have the curl of some quantity over here is equal to 0. So if, if we have the curl of some quantity is equal to 0, we can use this top expression over here, this vector identity. We can write whatever is in the brackets over here as the gradient of some potential. So if I do that over here, if I write all of this as the gradient of some potential, that's actually going to guarantee that it's equal to 0. That is uh, guaranteed to us by this vector identity. So by convention, I'm actually going to add a minus sign. So I'm going to make this minus the gradient of phi. Now this minus sign over here is just a, a convention. It's kind of like if you imagine a ball rolling down a hill. What you're interested in is the negative of the gradient. The ball is going to roll down the hill. So in physics, a lot of the time, if you have some kind of potential function, you're going to have states moving down to a minimum. So they're not going to be going up towards a maximum. They're going to be going down towards a minimum. So that's why this minus sign is here. We're going to be going down a potential, not up a potential. And the gradient tells us the direction of steepest ascent. But we want the direction of steepest descent. So we're not going up the hill. We're going down the hill. So if you, if you just put a ball or some kind of wheel on a very uh, kind of uh, hilly surface, it will roll down towards a minimum. It's going to follow the direction of the negative gradient. So that's why we put, we put a minus sign by convention over here. Now, we could move this minus sign into the definition of phi. But it's much more convenient to do it this way, because you can clearly see that there is a negative sign over here. And you can clearly see some kind of potential. 
So let's have a look at what this implies for us. So we know uh, from this vector identity that if we take the curl of whatever is in here, that's going to give us 0. So that guarantees that we can write this stuff inside the brackets uh, as the gradient of some potential. So what does this give us? This gives us another expression. It gives us the electric field plus this time derivative over here. It's a partial time derivative of the vector potential. That is equal to minus the gradient of the scalar potential. So now we have the electric field, and we have an expression involving a and phi, which are the scalar and vector potentials. But now what we can do is we can just move this to the other side of the equation. And that's going to give us this final expression. We're going to have the electric field is equal to minus the gradient of phi minus, because we're moving the derivative on the other side, we're going to have minus the partial time derivative of a. And we also know from up here, we know that the magnetic field can be written as the curl of A. So we have the curl of A over here, and over here we have a combination of the gradient of phi, and we also have a combination of uh, this partial time derivative. So these guys down here are what we were trying to derive. We have a curl of some A, and we also have this combination over here. So this is implicitly three equations over here, and this is also implicitly three equations. We have an x, y, and a z component for the magnetic field. And we also have an x, y, and z component for the electric field. So if we were to take the, uh, the x component of the electric field, this would just turn into an x derivative. And this would turn into a time derivative of the x component of A. And over here, we'd have a more complicated mixture uh, involving the curl. Because the curl involves a bunch of derivatives for the x component, the y component, and the z component. And you can see that explicitly written in the previous video where we do derivations uh, for these vector uh, identities. So we have expressions of, uh, for the electric field and the magnetic field in terms of the scalar and vector potentials. This is very, very useful. So in the next few videos, we're going to be using these guys, and we're actually going to be transforming all of classical electromagnetism in terms, uh, and, and trying to describe them in terms of phi and a. So in, in the previous few videos, we actually looked at Maxwell's equations. And Maxwell's equations tells us, uh, tell us how the electric and magnetic fields change over time. And they also tell us how charges respond to electric and magnetic fields. So if we're given charge distributions and currents, then we can work out what the electric and magnetic fields are. And from that, we have enough information to predict how charges will move in 3D space. Now this is a different way of looking at classical electromagnetism. Instead of looking at electric and magnetic fields, you look at these guys, the scalar and vector potentials. And this actually encodes a lot of information. And what it's actually going to do is it's going to take Maxwell's equations, which are four uh, first order equations, it's going to turn them into two second order equations. And we're going to do that in uh, later videos in the electromagnetism playlist. Another thing that I want to stress is that phi and a are not uniquely determined. You can have multiple different versions of phi and a that give the same electric and magnetic fields. And that introduces the topic of gauge transformations and gauge invariance. And that is what will be covered in the next video in the electromagnetism playlist. So make sure you watch all of these videos on electromagnetism. You can find them in the electromagnetism playlist.